those of you who uh, are not in a hurry, maybe it would be nicer if you come forward. Uh, uh, I really wish uh, George was giving this lecture last week or the week before so that there would be more people. And I know that this is uh, a jury week, so uh, it, it is a problem for a lot of the, uh, the units in terms of uh, uh, the audience. But I, I, I know um, that uh, all of us are going to uh, find George's uh, lecture fantastically interesting. Uh, I have known George as a friend and colleague for, uh, for a number of years. We both uh, taught together in the States, and uh, uh, George has taught in a number of uh, schools, uh, such as Harvard and Yale and uh, RISD and uh, Rice and all the all the places, and he's currently teaching at uh, University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver. Among uh, many areas, one of the territories that he has worked on is uh, been the relationship between, um, uh, in a sense, art and architecture. He was uh, very influential in organizing a series of, I think, now in retrospect were really very important exhibitions uh, at Harvard, bringing uh, contemporary artists uh, to the school. And this connection between uh, contemporary art and architecture is something that uh, has preoccupied him for uh, a number of uh, years. He has got a very wicked sense of humor, and I think that that, 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 also, that also comes through his, uh, his astute uh, uh, analysis of uh, projects and the way that he's really developed uh, his own studio practice. Um, and I'm sure you will all uh, join me in welcoming George Wagner. Yay. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm sorry. And I'm very honored to um, be here, and thank you all for coming. It's um, especially nice for me to be here among friends, which I am. Um, maybe we can start by turning the lights on. Is that done there? And then I control the slides here, right? Right there. Oh, too fast. So uh, what I want to do tonight is describe some attributes of architectural practice in the United States after the Second World War. My interests are specific. I would argue that there are a number of cultural forms which went on to characterize late industrial American culture awkwardly, even if quite distinctively. Recent discussions of abstract expressionist painting have recast the dialogues of subjectivity process and artistry in light of Cold War nationalism. While it might be a topic that is overlooked, it should not be surprising that modern architecture has been discussed in relation to the other arts. I am thinking, for instance, of reverberations between cubism, uh, reverberations of cubism in the paintings of Le Corbusier, or the range of artifacts uh, produced under the heading de style. In addition, I want to describe the way in which in the 50s, many, many of the functions of architecture were displaced and popularized as the burgeoning markets infiltrated and refigured everyday life. To do this, we need to recognize, um, oops, the slide there. Um, to do this, we need to recognize the extent which advertising and the visual media of magazines and televisions became agents of social control and behavioral programming. It would be easy to trace a linear path through the 1940s and 50s and to observe architectural practice becoming increasingly organized in its incorporation and professionalism. Um, <laughs> I 
just to stop for a minute with these images, they basically say everything I have to say in one image. Uh, this is a, a two layouts from Playboy magazine of a party night at the Playboy Mansion in Chicago. Um, what is important to me is this right here, uh, uh, the cooning that Hugh Hefner owns. And then in his bedroom over his bed, I believe this is a Franz Klein. Um, but uh, at this moment, you can actually see the kind of um, aesthetic, difficult life of abstract expressionism meeting the most robust life um, of the market and doing very well at it. Um, in fact, I could start in 1893 and blame it all on Daniel Burnham's extravaganza in Chicago as an occasion when the large-scale production oriented office took shape in North America. Meanwhile, the figure of the abstract expressionist artist stood tall, generating, myth generating mythologies of artistry that have, in some instances, instances, lasted longer than the art itself. The 50s generated the lingering alienation in architecture between corporate practice and artistic practice. Or the continued belief that not, don't, not only does an avant-garde exist, but it, that it can magically thrive simply on the novelty of radical form. So I'm going to do uh, three things um, tonight in this lecture. It's really broken into three parts. One of the things that has um, <laughs> really appealed to me as I've written more is the fact that you can uh, separate a text into parts. So you know, write a bit, call it one, write a bit, call it two. And another bit, call it three. And it really doesn't matter whether the bits connect. It's the problem of the reader to um, begin to develop and uh, affect echoes between them. I like to imagine that some, such a structure would work uh, in a lecture. I realize that it's naive that the lecture is a kind of has a narrative continuity. But um, I'm afraid it's something that we're going to be stuck with. So in the first part, um, the basic question I want to investigate is, what was the relationship between architecture and abstract expressionism. How can we understand it? And I want to talk about, um, most significantly, significantly about a conference that occurred at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in uh, 1951. Secondly, I want to speak about um, the way in which uh, the ubiquity of commercial values, as pictured in the popular press, affect the representation of public and private spatial imagination. In what form did subjective fantasy become a fabric, uh, become a product, preaching in the second person for a refigured self? Um, in this discussion, the idea of the self, the idea of the subjectivity uh, of the painter, the abstract expressionist painter, um, the as a seer uh, in the 1950s is understood as um, being sort of returned towards the consumer. Um, when there's a vast number of products being offered to the consumer and always being offered in the second person, becoming vehicles that can allow them to reconfigure and remind, um, or remind the very nature of them of their selves. The 1950s. This is the third third section. The 1950s were the moments um, of uh, significant uh, or reorganization in the visual arts. Um, the in North America, the um, status of the various professional organizations was really um, uh, s structured and solidified in the 1950s. Um, it was at this moment, for instance, that um, interior decorating became um, formally organized as interior design and broke away um, from architecture as a separate um, discipline with considerable outcry and dialogue. And landscape really began to clarify its own professional structure. And a number of serious documents produced by the AIA really began to try and describe what the role of the architect was going to be. So then finally, the last thing I'm going to do is, as a case study, perhaps of all of this, just show you one church by the New York artist Wallace Harrison that um, I think engages and sews together some of these issues. Um, so first, what was the relationship between architecture and abstract expressionism? I find the question relevant for a number of reasons. First, because of the found profound difference between the creative and conceptual technique of abstract expressionist painting and architecture. The painting suggests an aesthetic process which is immediate and almost primitive. 
most always invoking the bodily presence of the artist. The intentions of the artist and the meaning of the work have been extracted through reliance on the subjective, allowing the word to represent some privileged, private, and wordless state of interior life. And yet, to a degree that I find alarming, our appreciation of artistry, and far too frequently this holds true in schools of architecture, is derived from this subjective and mystical model. In fact, the artistry of architecture is more similar to the ready-mades of Duchamp, exploiting as it does the existing language of its materials and the way in which those materials and the particulars of their presentation distance the author from the subject. The process of conceiving, representing, and building architecture is an elaborate sequence of thresholds, distancing the work from the architect's body. Um, <laughs> if I hadn't been living in Greece for five months, and if I had had a computer um, and a library and a slide library, I would show you now, for instance, the corner door of, of um, Marcel Duchamp, um, which is, I think, the perfect illustration of the thing that I'm trying to say. I'm left uh, with a Rothko and, a, and an Anthony Caro. Um, over the past 10 or 15 years, a group of art historians, T.J. Clark, Serge Guibault, and Michael Ija, have described the way in which the subjective aspects of abstract expressionist painting had, in fact, been used to represent and secure the dominance of the United States in the Cold War. Lija maintains in his book, Reframing Abstract Expressionism, which is one of the best texts that's sort of taken on um, the role of abstract expressionism. I'm quoting here. What seemed to be knowledge and discovery inscribed in New York School painting, namely a new form of subjectivity, riven and besieged, rife with unconscious and primitive instincts and impulses, was rather construction with myriad ideological ramifications for the dominant culture in the United States in the 1950s, 1940s, and 50s, and since. I will not make the same claims for architecture, but I would like to investigate the way in which architectural practice was weathering the forces of the era and what sort of dialogues accompanied that passage. Of interest in this discussion is a conference that took place at the Museum of Modern Art in New York on March 19, 1950 almost 50 years ago. The title of the conference was The Relation of Painting and Sculpture to Architecture. The moderator of the symposium was Philip Johnson, and the participants included Ben Shahn, Jose Luis Serre, Frederick Kiefsler, and Henry Russell Hitchcock. Among the respondent, respondents in the audience were Amy de Ozafon, Percival Goodman, Serge Chermaya, Mark Rothkow, and Richard Lippold. Of course, one needs to ask why this question was considered important at that time. Was it the vitality of the visual arts to which architecture wanted access? Was it the fact that the very artistry of architecture was in question? Or did the routines of modernist art practice dictate an autonomy for much of the visual art, for each of the visual arts, withdrawn into their own media, what Clement Greetberg would have called pure painting, pure sculpture, and pure architecture? On the first page of the unpublished transcript, an editor's hand has intervened to change symposium to discussion and retitled the event, How to Combine Architecture, um, Painting and Sculpture. That's changed from the relation between architecture, painting, and sculpture. The disagreement about the title of the symposium is significant and comes very close to distilling the very issues meant to be addressed there. The combination of architecture, art, and sculpture sounds easy, as if, as if in a recipe, inert ingredients were brought together or as in couture, essential accessories were combined to produce the perfect ensemble. In the, in the text, the combination is frequently described as having been reduced to the embellishment of, archite to, to the embellishment of architecture by painting and sculpture, an embellishment that had become increasingly problematic over the previous decade as painting and sculpture retreated into a formal autonomy grounded in non-objectivity and the expulsion of narrative modes. In fact, little of that artistic culture was inert in 1951, especially for architect architecture, the orphaned mother art. Caught as it was between the urgent subjectivity of abstract expressionism and the inevitable physical expansion of the North American democracy. The title suggests an assumption that as we consider combinations of architecture, painting, and sculpture, 
we are certain and secure about the differences between each discipline, evenly weighted, and the order of their aesthetic engagement. It does not acknowledge the stretched boundaries between the arts and the different levels of cultural visibility between them and their blurred distinctions. The relation, on the other hand, of painting and sculpture to architecture suggests, in its familial reference, a less certain and perhaps more fractious scenario. It also opens onto an aesthetic turbulence which had been the inevitable result of the political and economic storms of the previous de decade. As abstraction and non-objectivity strip the art of narrative, it also challenged the utility of their cultural function. Speaking of the unstable and competitive relationships between the arts, Clement Greenberg had written in 1940, and I quote, now, when it happens that a single art is given the dominant role, it becomes the prototype for all art. The others try to shed their proper characters and imitate its effects. The dominant art, in turn, tries to absorb the function of the others. A confusion of the arts results by which the subservient ones are perverted and distorted. They are forced to deny their own nature in an effort to, to attain the effects of the dominant art. Um, as a refresher for you into Greenbergian art theory, I might recall that in an act of preservation against the corrupting markets and the demons of kitsch, he argued that each art withdraw into its own medium, expelling narrative, and find there a refuge in pure form. In painting, that might be flatness. In architecture, it might be tectonics. In fact, in the face of Greenberg's theory, Kenneth Crampton's ideas about tectonics sound very much like an advocacy for the sort of inward turning and formal self-reference. But let me give you an example of the situation Greenberg described as a way of illustrating the relevance of these ideas. Imagine, if you can, that architecture is not a dominant art. Figure, then, in order to model the image of vitality, that the representation of architecture is calibrated to simulate the effects of another practice. Say, for instance, graphic design, with all its circus gloss, and visual possibility. In this way, the static art of architecture might acquire the vibrancy of a more popularly effective visual practice. Working in the um, slide library before um, to <laughs> uh, pull some slides, I had to make a rule for myself that I would not illustrate um, that particular point uh, with images of any graduate of this school. So I have no images to illustrate that point. But back to our conference. In 1951, the participants might have been clear about the differences between their own practices, painting, sculpture, and architecture. Yet it was difficult to definitively declare, as Greenberg insists, in what way these practices might together be synthesized into a coherent work. In short, to understand how architecture might have a steady voice without breaching the autonomy and the techniques of the other arts. The most common, common form of artistic integration in 1951 was large murals for the painters and sculpture in plazas for the sculptors. Johnson characterized two sorts of relations where scu that sculpture and architecture might have. The first is a disjunctive, based on combinations and juxtaposition, with a model being the Colbe, which I just showed in the Barcelona Pavilion. The second, um, uh, the Colbe or the Calder here in this um, building. The second is integrated, illustrated by Gaudi, Romanist, or the Romanesque Gothic or Asian temple, or in this instance, uh, Erosarna's uh, airport at JFK. The example used in the conference uh, was of architects wanting to be sculptures. Of course, most of them believe they are sculptures, and sculptors <laughs> wanting to be architects. Clearly, Frederick Kiesler had been invited to the modern because his work, specifically The Endless House, Johnson called it a droop egg. Here's the model of The Endless House, and um, a bit of the interior space with the window showing. Um, he, uh, he had been invited because The Endless House so intently blurred the line between architecture and sculpture. And Sert was there as president of CIA, CIAM to represent the drive to rationalize the production of architecture and urban form. 
a process which relegated painting and sculpture, frequently non-objective, to secondary and decorative roles. Around these poles, artist or bureaucrat did the split identity of the post-war architect develop. As chief architect of two prominent urban ensembles, the United Nations, then under construction, and Rockefeller Center, Wallace Harrison was mentioned several times at the Kitchener Symposium. Harrison had come to be understood as a liaison between the world of high art, both in his relationship to the Rockefellers, to the museum, and to prominent artists, and the world of a new monumental urban architecture. Um, the mention was not surprising in the context of the conversation, since at Rockefeller Center, Harrison had overseen one of the great disasters in the attempt to officially integrate art and architecture in the 20th century, the erased murals of Diego Rivera. Now, these are not the murals that were erased by the Rockefellers in New York. Um, they were photographed before they um, were erased. Um, but I included these murals of Diego Rivera, which are um, in Detroit at the Turning to Fine Art, just to, to um, give you an example of his murals and also to show, um, give some idea of the content of his murals and how the content of his murals and the Marxism that stood behind it um, could become offensive. The integration of the art failed, Thompson said, because he, that's uh, Harrison, faced a typical problem of our times. Because due to the way it was built, due to the politics, Harrison couldn't start with an artist in the beginning. End quote. That is, he couldn't control the artist. As the Rockefeller's architecture exemplified the glories of an inspired and affluent patron patronage, Rivera painted a critical countertext, one both cognizant of the accomplishments of capital and importantly critical of its values. In more benign installations, illustrated by example of uh, Lipschitz, Kolbe, and Lippold, abstract painting and sculpture were used decoratively, detached from specific reference to the host building's program as a patron might employ them in a private residence. Um, these are two examples of uh, the decoration, other decorations that um, were included in the ensemble of Rockefeller Center. And uh, so I think one of them is Noguchi and the other is uh, um, someone named Lowry. Which is on the left, obviously. Um, but in, uh, in a 1957 exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art uh, called Buildings for Business and Government, the curator set out the terms necessary for the successful integration of the arts. Um, this is like obviously a continuous theme, theme through the 1950s. And there had been another conference by the same title in 1952 held at the Architectural League. But they were argued for the successful integration of the arts, arguing that the collaboration, quote, must depend on the exact co coincidence of the architect's and sculptor's intention. As an alternative, the architect may execute the sculpture himself. Um, so the idea that there would become collaboration was uh, overshadowed by the possibility that the architect might thus expedite the situation by completing the sculptural work themselves. So much for the autonomy of the arts. An architect and artist conspire in their service to the client. In the end, it might just be easier to make the building sculpture altogether. The most prescient words in the 1951 conference belong, not surprisingly, to Frederick Kiesler, whose predictions engaged the relationship between the arts through the reconsideration of the very forms they would take. Kiesler said that, quote, the conventional forms of past times, such as murals, such as niches with sculpture, such as painted ceilings or the ornamented type of flat design, all that will undergo enormous change, a change which will have hardly any resemblance to the past. Haunting the conference, I mentioned several times, was the mammoth backlit transparency in Grand Central Station. It's gone now, and I don't know whether many of you saw it. It's not in the, your slide library in any of the pictures of Grand Central Station, and there are quite a few, but for many years there was a one wall of huge, uh, had a huge backlit transparency, usually of a landscape. And it was always considered a serious defamation of the interior. It was extremely visible. Sarah acknowledged that the painting on the ceiling was invisible, but that the huge, intrusive wall of image was powerful and very much alive. The remark 
foreshadows the significant changes that were imminent in the visual arts. In fact, this conference was held at the last possible moment these issues could have been relevant. The very forms of the, of the arts were changing so significantly as to blur their distinctions. In the wings were the first combines of Robert Rauschenberg, the early works of Klaus Oldenburg, the happening, the bedroom, and the store, all works that completely broke the, um, s the simple and severe typology that were characterized in this conference. And I wanted to show you just a few works um, that are <laughs> contemporaneous with this period. Uh, um, these are just four works from the competition that was held in 1956 for the Franklin Delano Roosevelt competition. This was to be the major um, public uh, monument in Washington, D.C. to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who you know was a um, three-term president and an incredibly um, important figure. And uh, so it was given an enormous amount of importance in a cultural way. Um, the winning scene is actually the scene on the right. And I, um, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of the facts I need tonight, again, because I don't have all my papers in the library. But um, I know that William Pedersen was involved with this scene. And I can't tell you who the authors were um, for the others. In this scene on the right, the tablet contains large, um, obviously, text um, by uh, Roosevelt. And you simply kind of wander through. But I think it um, shows as vividly as anything could show um, architecture trying to identify some form of identi identity in the language of its own and losing a sense of it in any way of its own materials and types. Um, it's a really fascinating uh, uh, set of book to look at. It's published in a book um, because you actually sense so strongly uh, that an entire discipline has to grip and doesn't actually know how to um, take on the rest. These are um, two more. <laughs> the one on the left is really choice. It's hard to imagine what it is. And the one on the right is another. So, um, so I'm now entering the second part of my lecture. Um, and the question of, the, of this part of the lecture is to ask in what way was spatial imagination seized and popularized by the expanding markets? What traditions and types of architecture were transformed? Uh, um, the two, two important versions were taken up. Um, the domicile, that is the rejection of domestic life and personal fantasy, uh, is, is one sort of area for um, uh, sort of that was colonized commercially. And then the idealization of urbanity focused on privatization and consumption. Um, Sarah at the Modern Art Conference clearly engaged the expansion of advertising and the control of public images and the parallel um, institutionalization of the visual arts. He had said, visual stimulus in our cities is controlled by commercial advertising. Commercial advertising is in touch with the people, but the works of the great creative of our time are not shown in places of public gallery. Unfortunately, they go from the artist's studio to the deep freeze compartment of the museum. There they are gathered and belong to history. They join forces with the past before they even meet the present. So it's trying to describe a way in which fine arts are completely overshadowed and taken away by the kind of dense powers of um, fantasy production. Uh, this recognized um, what the future might be. A significant component of the dialogue surrounding the visual arts in the 50s had to do with subjectivity and the venting of the inner life of the artist. Ben Chan had explained the process in a broad way, stating that, quote, scientific skepticism forms our outlook and leads to non-objective art. Non-objective art denies all values and all content except the machinery with which it is put together. I have heard that non-objective art is pure emotion. Well, that is pure mystique. Emotion is not an abstract quality. It always has an intent, close quote. So Ben Chan doesn't deny at all that subjectivity exists in the arts. He simply ex attempts to excavate some uh, intent from it. 
Other discussions would be satisfied to Paul if the sight of the sublime, the unconscious, or the throne of the ego. Barnett Newman had said, the self, terrible and constant, is for me the subject matter of painting and sculpture. Elsewhere, Newman had declared, instead of making cathedrals out of Christ, man or life, we are making it out of ourselves, out of our own feelings. The reason I want to focus on the self as the epicenter of creativity is as a way of suggesting that individuality and identity were broadly understood commercially. Put another way, the self was not only the site of the subject's creativity and expression, it was the target, through the language and subjectivity and identity, of marketing. Uh, Serge Guibault, author of How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art, cites the importance of the famous kitchen debate that occurred between Nixon and Khrushchev in which the two argued the merits of their respective economic systems in a model kitchen showroom. His discussion illuminates the extent to which the dis discourse of the era occurred before a reconfigured landscape of domestic fantasy. Frequently, those fantasies were pitched to the reader in the second person. Um, these are simply two images from uh, popular mechanics. The one on the left is uh, from 1951, and the one on the right is from 1961. These are actually very characteristic of the kinds of images that you would have seen, and the text that accompanied them uh, would have always been in the second person. But the, the article on the left would have been called, How to Build Your Own Helicopter. Um, and there are numerous other articles, some things like How to Build Your Own Submarine. But in these kinds of, um, in these articles, there's really an attempt to kind of bore into the head uh, of the reader, of the subject, and allow them to reimagine who they are. There's a very um, sort of direct and, and rich relationship between the fantasies being offered and the um, opportunity for the reconstitution of the self. Her famous book of the 50s, Sex and the Single Girl, uh, Helen Gurley Brown in began her article saying, her book, and it was a very influential book, very large seller, um, if you are to be a glamorous and sophisticated woman, that exciting things happen to you. Um, that's the first line. How you might become um, this other thing. Playboy, beginning uh, in publication in the early 50s, produced a whole elaborate set of um, images which uh, were written in the second person and described how the, uh, the reader, uh, the subject, might, um, through uh, design uh, and interiors, acquire a kind of uh, a more intensified, and more robust sexual life. Um, these uh, interiors were full of mechanisms which empowered the individual. And I'm in this, in some of these, I'm very interested in, for instance, the way in which images and artistic images have been included. In this one right here, you can see um, they brought representations from the caves of Lascaux and applied them to the bathroom, the interior of the bathroom uh, of the kitchen. And since we're on the subject of bathrooms, I thought that um, this bathroom here, which is actually the private bathroom of Hugh Hefner in the Playboy Mansion in Chicago, was of particular interest because of the introduction of um, private infrastructure empowering um, the self and constructing the identity of the individual. Um, got a complete telephone and a telephone that's right. um, The Playboy townhouse uh, I'm <laughs> including again because if you remember that first slide where I showed you a jacuni, um, the same painting becomes the uh, the cocooning was <laughs> understood as being uh, an artifact that would be central to this uh, new landscape. It actually, the project is a project that Hefner had designed for himself, and um, he had intended to move into it. He never did. Through the window right here um, is just visible the gable of the front of the existing Chicago place. But, um, and 
the, again, the text is all built around the production of a kind of um, fantasy for a new life direct, um, directed exactly to the reader. Here's a section of that building, the uh, porch here, the pool, central atrium, uh, kitchen, uh, work of art, work of art. Um, well, I mean, it's hard to know where to start with this. This is obviously the round bed of um, Hugh Hefner, that it was in the Playboy Mansion in Chicago. This is the design for it, um, which was at made for the townhouse that we just saw. That was at the first moment it had been, been seen. Um, and th you can see it um, in the little section of key here. The thing that the only thing um, that I think is important um, and adds to, to, to this is to understand how um, the appeal, again, what I would call the appeal to it itself, the, um, the cultivation of the subjective life of the consumer um, involved the fulfillment of a numerous fantasies. Um, I've written elsewhere that these fantasies brought um, a an electronic infrastructure to the domestic space uh, of the dweller, um, a, an electronic infrastructure that in so many ways was like the uh, urban infrastructure of someone like Daniel Burnham who would superimpose large system, ma matricized systems to control the field of the city. Here, um, control becomes um, personal, individual, and domestically oriented. And it simply goes to show that the headboards here are um, elaborate devices which allow this bed to turn, to spin at various speeds, um, and into uh, involve major telephone system, telephone and television systems. And do so at a moment, actually, when this kind of technology was extremely crude and primitive. To go to the Playboy Mansion before it was um, destroyed was to be overwhelmed by the, um, just the, the amount of volume of infrastructure it required to produce um, this fantasy. Um, this is uh, finally um, the uh, project that what is a late project actually in Playboy and um, one that was sort of I think turning inward turning towards the cell and towards the drug culture it's uh, in the sort of minimalist mode it's called the um, duplex penthouse you can get a sense of um, a painting on the right um, right there but the text goes, the parts of the text go a little bit like this. An outward reflection on the inner self. The individualization that is ever more important in today's world is most readily achieved, we believe, by working from a vividly conceived and pleasingly proportioned architectural matrix for living to be imprinted with each owner's choice of colors, textures, works of art, and personal diblo, to be they heirlooms or recent acquisitions. The outsize of abstract that you've been admiring was created with a braving, abrasion proof acrylic paints uh, applied to the surface that opened by remote control to reveal the latest in video and audio equipage. So, what they're saying actually here, and the point is that the, um, the canvas there is, is not a work of art, it conceals the, the um, electronics behind that control the interior space of the domicile. Um, and this is uh, simply an example of a bedroom uh, on the left of the Playboy penthouse, and then a kind of similar um, apparatus produced in a John Lautner house in Los Angeles. Um, and what Playboy wrote about this space goes like this. Once the floor to ceiling painted panels on the wall behind the head of the bed are flipped back, a battery of projectors connected to the control panel between the headdress can, if you so choose, turn the room into an electric surface of swirling colors that contrast with blinking strobe, fired in time of your choice of freaky far out sounds. Or if softly romantic mood is what you're after, the room can glow like an ember. 
the walls and ceiling pleasantly pulsating, while you're serenaded by sounds more smoothly conducive to matters at hand. You understand, of course, that the role of the architecture here is to wire itself exactly to the organ of the inhabitants. Um, jumping um, significantly. Um, This is Victor Grun's Fort Worth plan. It was produced in 1956. And um, I'm going to just read you uh, a little bit about it. I'll tell you about it first. Um, Fort Worth is a fairly um, normal town. You probably know it. It's the sister city of Dallas. The downtown is described uh, right there. The only important thing that one can say about Fort Worth uh, as a city is that it has an accent, which is, uh, there is the Tarrant County Courthouse comes down that street. It sort of survives there. This is an interesting project for a number of um, reasons. One is it's just about contemporaneous with Louis Kahn's project in Philadelphia. And in many ways, it's different. But of course, Louis Kahn has the ethical high ground, and um, uh, Victor Gruen has the ethical low ground. The idea was to sort of shore up uh, the center of the city, trying to turn it into a, a car-free walking so a series of service roads come in, you park all around, and then you enjoy this beautiful kind of Europeanized center city. Um, the other thing that's important about what they did was that they um, put all of the services for all of the stores underground. They basically built another city underground, connecting the interior of all of the buildings. Um, I see this project very much in as um, a continuation of the kind of modernist utopia, but completely within the language and the format of uh, uh, American capital, uh, and obviously not offering any um, moral correction or moral imperative, but um, similarly fantastic. Uh, and the reason that I'm interested in, it in this talk is because the plans that were written for it um, to promote it <laughs> were completely written in such a way as to appeal to individuals. So um, what we would find, oh, actually, let me just... Uh, read you about it. Um, so the text of the, um, of, the, of the Fort Worth plan describes the way in which the form of the city is inscribed into the average day of the average man and woman, and in so doing presents the clearly, the narrowly, <laughs> the narrow and prescribed social roles in the United States in the 1950s. The text is in the second person. And um, you might start, like, with this one. Uh, you live in the southwest section of the city and are employed in a downtown office building. You have your home and enter the freeway shortly thereafter, drive for five minutes at a steady 50 mile per hour clip, stepping off the moving ramp, which brings you down from the upper level where you have parked your car. You walk out into the morning sunlight and stop for a moment to gaze at a panorama that has never ceased to thrill you. It reminds you of Rockefeller Center in New York. Or for this fellow right here. You are standing by a window in your downtown office, looking out over the city. You have spent the morning reviewing quarterly sales figures, and the figures are good. Your suburban stores have more than, than kept pace with the growth of the downtown store. New office buildings downtown have meant more residents for the city, and more residents for the city have resulted in more business for suburban shopping centers, as well as for downtown. Yes, things have turned out well. All segments of the city have benefited. So you can see through the window, obviously, the character of the plan and the character um, of the open space. And finally, um, uh, uh, here we are right here. You are a housewife living in the greater Fort Worth of tomorrow. As you roll along comfortably on the noiseless electric shuttle car that carries you from one end of downtown to a luncheon appointment at the new tea room on the other end of the central district, 
you mentally check over all that you have been able to accomplish in the short period of time since you left your home on the east side this morning. There had been the real estate business at the bank, the attorney, then back to the bank again. I stopped for coffee, over an hour of shopping, and with all that, you were going to be early for your lunch. Tell me when I'm warm. This guy? This guy. Oh, here. Yeah. Anyway, um, I love these images um, because they're really suggestive of a, of a way that architecture is made. And also because um, I think that the image of uh, the image of Harrison is very telling. Um, the social agendas, uh, European modernist architecture, and the subjective invi individualism of American abstract expressionism had provided models which influenced the way in which creativity was conceived of in architecture. On one hand, the new architect was a seer, illuminated by the theory and belief that both uh, an author and a medium could, as Le Corbusier said, express modern times. Alternately, the scale of architectural practice changed after the war uh, in the direction of precedence already established by Daniel Burnham in 19, 1893 and the associated architects led by Wallace Harrison at Rockefeller Center. The architectural practice of Wallace Harrison um, is best known for large-scale commissions in which he worked as coordinating architect. Um, Rockefeller Center, uh, Lincoln Center in Manhattan, the Empire State Plaza in Albany, which is the project that he built for Nel Nelson Rockefeller, and is seen on the right, and the scheme on the left, which was never built, but it's a plan for the East River that was called X City. Um, his professional life suggests two versions of the role of architect and the changing realities of architectural practice. In a book, titled Building USA, published in 1957 by the editors of Architectural Forum to announce the new conditions of practice. The new client was described, quote, as a hydra-headed corporation. The, pa the practice of architecture, they said, had become the art of organization. Instead of solving every problem of design and direction, the architect, if he keeps his authority, if he keeps his authority, must find and organize and mediate among the men who will handle the separate component problem. Um, the passage describes the way the architect, as we might imagine the hero of a film noir, a man between men alienated by the very situation that defines his identity. This is what I see in those images so, uh, so strongly um, of Harrison being the kind of, uh, the kind of lynch and, and seeing him and, and see the architect being posed in the 1950s as kind of existential um, hero, except uh, in many cases the stakes were not so high. In the conference at the Modern, Johnson, uh, that I referred to earlier, Johnson had made reference to Pietro Belusky, 
the Portland, Oregon architect, who was then dean of the School of Architecture at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a member of the Fine Arts Commission in Washington, D.C. These credentials allowed him, Johnson claimed, to act as, quote, an official spokesman for United States art. At this moment in 1951, it was possible to imagine such a figurehead and to imagine the visual arts, including architecture, as possessing nationalist values. Who might we choose for that position today? If not the LA Mr. Johnson, surely one of his compatriots from the Century Club, even in spite of their imagined avant-garde credentials. The dichotomy was clear anyway. We were given the architect as the artist, master of the subjective, or as corporate leader, rationalizing the world to the extent that his clients could be imagined, in the words of Ben Chan, to possess a stainless steel housewife, a glass bone baby, without sticky fingers, and wrought iron papa. Um, this is a nostalgic note. Because I've been talking about the um, profession, I just wanted to include two images which talk about the other side of the profession. This is the decorator, Billy, Billy Baldwin, on the left, being shown in his apartment in New York. Um, Billy Baldwin was an extremely influential decorator in the 50s and the 60s. Needless, needless to say, he was a big fag. Um, but at, in the arguments, the large arguments that um, surrounded the professionalization of, this, of the career, of interior design, Billy Baldwin argued that um, its name should always stay interior decoration, and that it shouldn't become this kind of professional and vacuous um, field known as interior design, and shouldn't acquire that professional quality. And there's a very large um, circle, I mean, body of, of writing that surrounds um, this change. On the right-hand side is um, the boudoir that he um, designed for Mrs. Cy Newhouse in New York, which is a good trip. So, I want to talk about the church. The historical models of artistic integra integration under crown and church kept the memory of the har harmony of the arts alive, and the Gothic's seamless union of liturgy and form provided an example where a search said, their paths cannot be separated. The only viable model left for the integration of the arts, Ben Chan argued, was religion. Quoting now, perhaps the most powerful unifying factor between art and architecture in times past um, has been religion. Some of you should be shaking your heads by this time. I realize that this indicates regret, as well as a firm conviction that religion can no longer move men to such boundless effort. Scientific skepticism has dislodged the golden le legend, and man has lost his soul. So all through the discussion, the church is always seen as the very thing that could unite the arts and could bring them together. But this scientific skepticism, this kind of deep shock uh, that followed the war, has brought that into question. But religion actually represented an arena of post-war life in which traditional values that is, values outside the economic and political mainstream, might be resuscitated to produce a refuge, an, an aesthetically integrated whole. The new church responded to the emerging suburban pattern and provided a program outside the objective determinants of institutional functionalism. If the harsh skepticism of post-war culture was to be breached, if a spirit and a soul found, perhaps the church and its silent subjective space could become the refuge of the sublime. In the preface of his book of 1956, The Modern Church, Edward D. Mills articulated the church's challenges beyond the liturgy in a future tainted and informed by the century's harsh and alien lessons. Mr. Mills said, recent events have shown that through the advance in nuclear science, this total destruction of the human race is within the realm of possibility. Yet we know the very forces of destruction could also be harnessed to make life fuller and happier for all mankind. This is the challenge that faces the Christian church today. For apart from the message of the church, the future, if there is to be a future, seems dark. Science 
to education and humanitarian ideals by themselves have all failed to provide a solution to world problems and have proved that they need to be inspired by faith greater than themselves. The hope then of the church was not necessarily a function of faith, but a function of despair, and it was as despair, and from despair, um, that it was produced. Um, I just want to look briefly at the kinds of um, two churches by Wallace Harrison, which I think are um, extraordinary churches in terms of the, um, the quality of their, their life. We don't have a section here uh, of this church. And if those of you who don't know it, there's a, um, the building sits on a moat. The moat um, the, and the wall separates at, at a point like this. And um, this, at the bottom of this, there'll be a large uh, sort of flat plane of glass um, above the uh, above the pool of water on the outside. So what happens is that light comes, hits the glass, and it makes the interior of the um, church tremble. It just trembles. Um, and so just a soft, trembling light that's very tenuous and very clear. And it, it's, you know, I mean, I could, <laughs> I could put a rock pill on the other side and I could show you this and show you this incredibly fine and, and um, careful light. Or we could look at the um, two churches. Well, on the right here is um, Rockcliffe Chapel in um, in uh, Houston. It's funny that it was called a chapel. It wasn't a chapel. He was appropriating the idea of the chapel and the sacredness of the chapel as a way of trying to find this this other space, this space kind of outside commerce, but a space that was necessarily dark um, and, and relatively bleak in its prospect. This is um, another church in, um, in, I think it's the North Christian Church in Columbus, Indiana by um, uh, Eric Sarnin. And it's an, it's an absolutely extraordinary building, but I don't think anyone's ever going to know it anymore. The church was built in such a way that um, this roof fits over this space in a way where they don't fit. They don't connect at all. And so it means that this is a large reveal of light, but it's also been outfitted with a, with a, um, with a whole bank of fluorescent light. But the quality that, that Sarnin was trying to get was clearly another one of these same qualities of soft, tremulous, um, sort of trembling, trembling light that um, I think very much describes um, a, a sublime but not transcendent uh, role for the church. So I now I want to look at this um, brief case study of uh, this church of Wallace Harrison's. Um, I could have started this uh, talk just by looking at this uh, drawing of Wallace Harrison on the left. I could have just shown you this drawing and not said anything else. This is the drawing that has um, <laughs> made me think a lot. Uh, a photo of Wallace Harrison sitting at his desk summons several mythologies of the post-war architect. Sleeves rolled up, he draws with charcoal what might be a building. In fact, the first Presbyterian church of Stanford, Connecticut, in an active st style reminiscent of abstract expressionist painting. The drawing, as in the work of the artist, the drawing, a section, reflects the immediacy of the artist's hand. The messy smudges betray a loyalty to passion, not to detail. Are we to believe that the urgency of the drawing might somehow be translated into the space of the building? That the sacredness of this private creative moment will not only survive the building process, but somehow direct it? Should we surmise that the passions of the drawing's author are translated directly into the form of the building, and conversely, that the building will speak through its form of the author's presence and suggest the immediacy of the creative act? A passion the ima image proved is shared between the architecture and the other visual arts. Or perhaps we should simply accept that this photo was contrived for a visit to the office of a photographer from Life magazine, and that shortly the architect will return to his own desk and its pressing business. We are left finally with one question. How do you build a drawing? Um, it's clear that this is an older black and white photograph of the interior of the church on the right. Wallace Harrison was awarded uh, the commission 
for the First Presbyterian Church in Stamford in 1953 and worked closely with the pastor Donald F. Campbell in its com uh, until its completion in 58. The project was very small and manageable and surely represented a clearing in the large-scale work that both defined and compromised his practice. The site was a hilly 10 acres on the edge of Stamford Center. Harrison left behind little writing about the church, and what there is is very much the direct talk of a practitioner. Quote, I do not believe that there's anything in architecture which is modern or old-fashioned. I believe only that buildings are good and bad. Close quote. The theory and the text are the building, and it is the practitioner's struggle to fuse the two. Not surprisingly, Harrison began the project, and these are sketches of earlier versions, began the project with an interest in Gothic space as an exemplar of artistic integration. It was his intention to, quote, create a place of worship with some of the splendor of colored light found in the great Gothic cathedrals, close quote. In a process developed by his friend, Fernand Leger, whose death in 1955 precluded his involvement in the project, the walls were embedded with colored chunks of glass compri comprised to represent the crucifixion and the resurrection. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and one of, the, one of the most interesting things about what it looks like is that the sun's always on one side and it's always lighting the other side. So you can see the right hand of the nave here um, is uh, the wall itself is actually lit, where this wall is completely black. The other thing that you can see is that um, for the most part, the altar recedes and doesn't really exist as a figure. Um, the walls become the total action of the church. But anyway, um, so Harrison really wanted to get Leger to do the stained glass. And Harrison actually imagined that it was possible that he could embed some images which describe the Christian liturgy in the wall of this church. And when you visit the church now, you're given this sheet and this sheet. I mean, okay, maybe you can see a cross there. But they're saying that there are horses in there, Jesus, Roman columns, you know, statuary. I, the point is, that for me, that isn't there. Um, and it simply wasn't possible given this, um, this uh, aesthetic strategy. strategy. Um, the form of the building was derived from the struggle to find a structural solution. Um, if the Gothic was a precedent, and the groin vaults shown in the earlier renderings confirmed that it was, an understanding of the elaboration of its structure is illustrative. The glazed wall of the Gothic cathedral occupies some ground, with the structural buttress perpendicular to the wall and postponed to the outside, creating an interior lightness that prompted Harrison to express that without reinforced concrete or steel, the builders of the 16th century built better than we do today. His intention was to build an interior space unencumbered by the intru uh, intrusive visual presence of structure. There is no structure visible in this building. If we had used ordinary methods of building just steel or concrete beams, these beams would have been over 28 inches deep, and the airy splendor we were trying to achieve would have been lost. The final project was realized with the help of the structural engineer Felix Samueli from London. The church was conceived of as a skin structure, a folded skin structure, produced from pre-cast pre concrete panels. There's a, a, one of the panels being pre-cast on the right-hand side. And here is the church under construction. Um, basically, these things were brought from the site. They were leaned against a scaffolding that occupied the nave. And then, as you can see in this drawing, the joint uh, exposed rebar at the joints um, was tied together and the seam made completely solid. Um, the central point's panels were latticed to allow for win uh, windows. Samuel's report states that whereas normal skin structures are used for roofs alone, in this instance the walls have also been included, resulting from the use of crystalline shape on the surface. By integrating wall and roof, the entire building is one structural unit. The space of the building is defined by the shape of the unit, which provides no interior walls at 90 degrees to the floor. Everything leans. 
construct the church or large scaffolding with built-in space of the nave, except at the central ridge spine, the wall is never more than eight inches thick. Um, the interior space possesses many of the qualities implied by the drawing. Animated, disorderly, vivid, vibrating. Because the walls are not parallel and taper towards the altar, the space extends as it envelops. The nave ends in a darkness that supposes it's down, with a large cross extending from peak to wall, its position and dimension suggesting a retrofit wooden frame. In natural light, the backlit lattice of the concrete structure recedes and acquires the expressive and urgent darkness of charcoal. In alternating sections, the glass continues to the roof ridge. The effect is of a glowing, jeweled, trembling cage. This is not a space of transcendent in which the parishioner's body is transubstantiated to pure spirit. In fact, the space confirms the body and the immediacy of one's own present inside this crushed lantern. It, its compatriot might be the Guggenheim Museum, for in both buildings, the architectural effects are so strong and concentrated as to overwhelm the actual program. It is clear from a review of the earlier work of Harrison, and most notably uh, from the trial on in Paris sphere at the uh, 1939 World's Fair, that he was quite familiar with the forms and dialogues of European avant-garde. If Harrison did not leave behind theories that promote his architecture, neither did Paul Shearpart, the poet and author of Glass Architecture in 1914, leave behind designs to illustrate just the form his text so vividly suggests. What emerges in the unspoken pedigree of Harrison's work and his turn to the subjective authorship of expressionism for this small project in the writing of Shearbart and Bruno Taut's Alpine Architecture. Shearbart described the union of a glass architecture and a reinforced concrete frame in his aphoristic volume. He said, this is Shearbart, the free churches of America may well be the first to build glass temples, thus making a good step towards the glass architecture in the religious sphere. It ought to be stressed that the whole of glass architecture stems from the Gothic cathedrals. Without them, it would be unthinkable. The Gothic cathedral is the prelude. Eric Mendelssohn's writing at the same point period begins to expand one's understanding of the influence of Expressionism on Harrison. Like Shearbart, he imagined the Gothic wall as the site of promising and undeveloped tensions. Mendelssohn forged the term constructed bulk, richly suggestive of a a charged skin mediating between mass and space. The outer wall, he said, acts upon the visible universe. Its physical compactness operates upon the illimitable, illimitable, uh, illimitable, uh, you know, ness of space. The outer wall collects light. The inner wall determines the center of gravity of the room by means of its limitations. The wall is an independent surface. Its decomposition brings about the sliding of the surface into surface, close quote. The discourse of the inner and outer wall defers to the wall itself as the site of explication, as the medium that does more than simply articulate the forces that pass through it. The building is hollow, and its interior is the void produced by the friction of the walls. In 1959, in connection with an exhibition um, of the same title, the Museum of Modern Art published a pamphlet. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in what the Museum of Modern Art had to say about architecture in the 1950s, because they didn't have a clue. And they were actually um, working off the kind of mysticism and mystification that um, was describing abstract expressionist painting and applying it to architecture and saying, you know, jack shit, basically. Um, but anyway, one of their shows that happened in 1959 was uh, called Architecture and Imagery, Four New Buildings. The four new buildings were Utsun Sydney Opera House, Saarinen's TWA Terminal, Guillaume Gillet's Notre Dame de Royan, and the Stamford Church. 
The claims made for the association between the projects were no more imposing than to acknowledge that some architects had chosen to reject the standardization of construction and typology and attempted to give their buildings a more individual character by choosing sculptural shapes such as domes, vaults, and massive columns or piers. I'm, I'm going to quote now. It is increasingly desirable that a building shape express some particular aspect of its purpose. <laughs> That's the sort of bottom line from the Museum of Modern Art. Shape expresses purpose. The text did not speculate as to what sort of sculpture, abstract or figurative, was then in vogue, nor did it elaborate on the role that iconography might play in this new expressiveness. Nor did it, its authors seek to unravel the relations between the arts, but they did attempt to describe the individual character of Harrison's church. The nave in Norfolk itself rise from both sides of the entrance, and together with the canted plains and splayed shape of the nave, give the church the appearance of a huge fish, an early Christian symbol equally apparent in the floor plan. I think I just showed you the floor plan. It seems unlikely that this is a reference that the architects had intended, even if the moniker of the fish church is still popularly used. Nor would the museum have gotten away with calling a Pollock a mess, a Rothko a blob, or Henry Mord a churd. At least their exhortations about painting would rehearse the expected myth. What was missing from the text was any recognition of the dynamic economy between the visual arts, which had figured prominently in earlier discourse. It becomes clear that the dialogues of subjectivity, which had characterized so much of the discourse of the era, left the museum unable <laughs> and unrepentant of the fact to engage Harrison's church in any significant way. On the subject of the, the Stamford church, that conversation might have engaged such questions as the indecipherable presence of the Christian tale in the folded plans of the windows, of the awkward attempt to produce appropriate fittings in the designs for altar furniture and pulpit. Um, on the right is one of the chairs of Harrison's office design. It's pretty funny, I think. It might have raised the question of how such a building is entered when every wall is leaning, and how portal and procession had historically figured in the integration of artistic ensembles. Um, this is the, actually the front door uh, of the church, um, and it's at the moment of a pinch, um, and you just, uh, this thing comes through, and you slide in and across the nave at that point and hope you turn right. To have engaged other questions would have required an affiliation to the object, not subject. The effect of branding the church sculptural is to ignore just how much architectural work it took, most of which is invisible, for Harrison and his consultants to produce so powerful a space, distilled from the elegant, if elegance can be tortured, distillation of the wall. Later discussions would lament the loss of language and iconography. Robert Venturi's taunt that space is what displays symbolism. But these arguments could not approach or appreciate the pure immediacy, the garbled blast the post-war era found so vital in painting, sculpture, and architecture. That's it. Yes, of course, if there was a question, I could try to engage it. Is there a, a decipherable link between uh, the that sort of flourishing expressionism in American architecture by the likes of Sarnin, I suppose, and, and Rudolph and Wallace Harrison, as you've just shown, and the um, rather healthy expressionism that's going on in American architecture today? Like Um, I actually think that um, that's the subject of my lecture. You know, <laughs> that um, that I mean, I actually I I'm very interested in the fact that it's all happened before, and that um, that there has there have been 
um, elaborate strategies of mystification that um, about architectural form. There has been, you know, endless belief in um, the avant-garde. I don't mean to sound cynical, and and the reason, I mean, and I'm pr I'm really proud that I'm not cynical because I really love that Church of Wallace Harrison. I think it's so beautiful, and I and I um. I became attracted to it because it scared the shit out of me. Because I, I couldn't imagine a building like that. But I, but I do think that there, you know, of course, there's uh, that quotation of, of Clement Greenberg's about how um, uh, an art that isn't dominant simulates the effects of the arts that are dominant, dominant as a way of trying to pump up its cultural importance. I think it's so much the, um, what has happened in, in uh, architectural production. Um, well, I don't, I mean, I don't think that you can't make architecture. Um, I'm just trying to describe a way that, that um, the, the way that, the way that, that our descriptions of the way that architecture was conceived um, really uh, affected. Uh, what I like about the 1950s is it, um, it's, it's all just happening. You can just see it. Um, we don't we don't think of um, our, the electronic infrastructures that we um, rule as giving us power. We don't we don't understand our remote controls as um, you know uh, ancillary fallacies, um, and we don't think of we don't construct all of that. But of course, that is what they are, and you can see it when you study the 1950s, when you can see how the the text that that kind of culture emerged from it you know it emerges from. Um, from the Playboy and, and from the idea, uh, idea about um, sexuality, I don't. I mean, I don't know what to say about now. It's everything is clearly um, s seriously uh, blurred. You know, Dan Graham makes uh, or attempts to make architecture, and um, endless numbers of architects try to try and make art. But there's not really a sense of um, what the discipline of architecture is by itself, and what an artistic architecture. Um, would be, especially in artistic architecture that didn't necessarily cop um, all of the crutches that um, the other arts provided. You know, an artistic architecture, for instance, which isn't um, in its drawings graphically dynamic. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, no one risks ugliness, or no one risks any just architecture. It's scary. It's scary. But it could be that we've all been bred on a, on a, a, on a feed that's so protein-rich that we could never st step back. And our expect ex expectations have been completely fueled by the markets. And the fact that we have television attention span. I mean, I do. It's totally, it's totally in the mass market, and it still completely exists. I mean, I, I think Martha Stewart is, is, you know, this she is that. That is what she is doing. And I also think that um, 
that this English magazine wallpaper is like such a completely thin and you know crazily visible example of, of um, making you know peddling the, um, desire. You know that the people that read it don't live that life. You know they don't live it. They don't live it. Most people don't live Martha Stewart's life. But I don't. Um, I don't. If you if you're asking about the Fort Worth plan, the Fort Worth plan was a sham. It was it was put together by a guy who ran a utility company as a strategy to increase electrical consumption in Fort Worth. It wasn't actually sponsored by a government, and so it it, it doesn't reflect anybody's consensus. It, 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 it um, reflects a, a strategy to produce process, profit, and so the the appeal to the self is just a, a, almost a kind of mask. It's interesting to think of the kind of alternatives that were growing up in that era, which were, of course, um, you know, community-based planning and stuff, where we'd all, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd get the community, we'd come into a room, we'd have big sheets of newsprint and black magic markers. I work with people like that now. Um, they think that's great. But, I mean, that's another way uh, of, of actually having subjectivity be more based more on community formation rather than on um, individual identity. Of course, that's incredibly stupid and archaic because capitalism needs to develop each individual, needs to colonize each individual um, as a consumer and develop each self. We don't need to develop community. <laughs> that's not very cynical. But 